The outcome of a reaction that generates a chiral product depends on the spatial properties of the reactants. And when we say outcome, we're referring to the yields of the different possible chiral products, the different enantiomers or diastereomers, for example. On this slide and the next, we'll look at two examples of reactions that generate chiral products and understand their difference in terms of the spatial properties of the two possible products that could form and the nature of the transition states leading to those products. So here, for example, we see a planar carbocation. I can draw this carbocation in a different orientation like this with the ethyl group off to the right, the methyl group pointing upward, and then the implicit hydrogen here, and the positive charges on the central carbon. So this is an achiral cation. And let's imagine a bromide anion coming in and attacking this cation either from above it, from the top face, or below it, the bottom face. What we find in practice is that we'll arrive at a 50-50 mixture of the products arising from top face attack and bottom face attack. The most important thing to notice about these yields is that they're equal to one another. And this will always be true for reactions of this type that generate products like this. The thing to notice about the products is that they share an enantiomeric relationship. The two products are enantiomers. Because the internal distances within enantiomeric molecules are the same, the two enantiomers have equal energies. And if we look at the reaction coordinate diagram down below, we see that the two products which are drawn on the outside of the diagram do in fact have equal energies. Since they arise from a common achiral set of precursors, the achiral cation and the achiral bromide anion, the transition states are enantiomeric, and the products, of course, are enantiomeric. So the two reaction pathways are complete mirror images of each other. The pathway for bottom face attack, which leads to the R enantiomer, is the exact mirror image of the pathway that leads to the S enantiomer via top face attack. Because all of these energies are the same, we can imagine that a particular substrate molecule has a 50-50 chance of being attacked from above or from below, leading to the two possible products. As a result, the two yields of products are equal. And if we get complete reaction, then we would expect 50% of one enantiomer and 50% of the other. The origin of this has nothing really to do with the reactivity of the cation and the anion, but the fact that both reaction pathways are completely enantiomeric. That's a consequence of the fact that the products are enantiomers and that we started with achiral reactants. What happens when we start with a chiral reactant and arrive at diastereomers? Let's think about a reaction coordinate diagram for the two possible pathways shown in green and red, which correspond to what we might call top face attack and bottom face attack. The green pathway being top face attack and the red pathway being bottom face attack. What we observe in practice is an unequal mixture of diastereomers. Note that these two yields, 95% and 5%, are unequal, and they're quite a bit unequal. Evidently, attack on the top face takes place much more rapidly or to a larger degree than attack on the bottom face. We can understand this by recognizing that unlike enantiomers, diastereomers have unequal energies. This is because the internal distances between the atoms in diastereomers are not the same. And so even thinking from a relatively simple basis like Coulomb's law, we would expect the energies of the two possible products to be different. It makes the most sense that the product arising from top face attack is the lowest energy product because it forms in greatest yield. So we'll draw that one fairly low and we'll draw the other product arising from bottom face attack a little bit higher in energy. Now the two of these arise from a common precursor, which because it's a cation, is probably much higher in energy than the products. So we'll draw that up here. Keep in mind that the origin of this energy difference has nothing really to do with the connectivity or the reactivity of the products. We can explain it completely just by noticing that the two products are diastereomers. This is enough information to conclude that the products have different energies. What about the transition states leading to these two different products? Well, if the products themselves are diastereomers, then that must mean that the transition states leading to those products, which contain partial bonds between the carbon and the bromine on either side, must be diastereomeric as well. So those two must have different energies. And given the way we spaced 
the product energies, it makes sense that the transition state leading to the green product is likely lower in energy than the transition state leading to the red product. To some extent, the trend that we observe in the product energies is followed or reflected by the transition states. So the overall reaction pathways, we climb a relatively large hill and go down to a relatively high energy product in the red case, and we climb a relatively small hill and go down to a relatively low energy product in the green case. That's completely consistent with the yields we observe. 95% for the lower energy, more quickly formed product, and 5% for the higher energy, more slowly formed product. Predicting which of two diastereomeric transition states is the higher or the lower in energy can get pretty difficult, and this isn't something that I'll expect you to do. But I will expect you to appreciate the fact that merely because the transition states are diastereomeric, we can immediately conclude that they have different energies. And as a result of those different energies, we should expect different yields of products arising from those two diastereomeric transition states.